One day while wandering around near the ruins of Charleston, we see something white in the tarry water near the ruined dam. What is that? It's moving. It has jets of tar spewing out of its back. This must be the Grafton Monster. Getting a bit closer, we see that it has ridiculously large arms, and it uses them like legs, walking around on its fists. This creature is devoid of hair and fur. It appears to have a thick, squishy skin. Where did this thing come from? Our story begins at 11 p.m. on June 16th, 1964. A young news reporter by the name of Robert Cockrell was heading home from work. He was a reporter at the nearby Grafton Sentinel newspaper. He was driving alongside the Tigert River. After rounding a turn, he saw something white in his headlights. He described it as, quote, a huge white obstruction on the right side of the road, standing between the road and the riverbank on a cleared off section of grass. It was huge, between seven to nine feet tall and about four feet wide. It was bone white with a slick seal-like skin or wearing some sort of clothing or armor that resembled seal skin. And it had no head. He immediately knew that it was a living creature, but the sight so terrified him that he raced home as fast as he could. <sighs> After calming down, he realized the importance of the sight he just saw. He got a couple of friends together, and they returned to the spot where Robert saw the creature. But upon returning, the creature was gone. There were no tracks, no signs of this creature having ever been there, except the grass where Robert said he had seen the creature had been crushed by something about four feet wide and heavy. At that moment, while they were still searching, the three of them heard a sound. It was a low whistling sound coming from the direction of the river. They made their way towards the river, but they didn't see anything. The whistling didn't get any louder, but it seemed to follow them wherever they went. The men went home, and Robert Cockrell kept quiet about it for a while, but he ultimately decided to tell his editor. Together they published a story about the sighting in the June 18, 1964 edition of the Grafton Sentinel. The article spread like lightning through the Grafton community. That very night, more than 100 teenagers and adults with flashlights and rudimentary weapons scoured the Tigert River, hoping to catch a glimpse of the headless horror. The search went on for days, and during that time, more than 20 people claimed to have seen it. Robert Cockrell interviewed everyone who had claimed to have seen the creature and recorded their findings. But the sightings were sometimes contradictory, and no one had quite as clear a sighting as Robert Cockrell himself. This led the Grafton Sentinel, only a few days later, to publish a second article dismissing the Grafton monster as a, quote, wildly imaginative story inspired by spring fever and a lack of recreational facilities. After the second article, the monster hunting in Grafton died down. But quietly and by himself, Robert Cockrell continued to investigate the monster. He interviewed dozens of people up and down the Tigert River, traveling as far north as Morgantown, and he recorded accounts from others that matched his own sighting. But no one at his paper would take him seriously. He finally found a welcome ear from Gray Barker, who wrote for a UFO magazine. Barker interviewed Cockrell, taking detailed notes, and intended to write an article, but he never did, though he did save his notes. In these notes, Cockrell is recorded as saying, quote, I knew the road well. The night was clear. As I glanced up, my high beams picked up a huge white obstruction on the right side of the road standing between the road and the riverbank on a cleared-off section of grass. 
After glimpsing the thing, I sped up to get off that road as soon as possible. My impressions of the beast were, it was between seven and nine feet tall. It was approximately four feet wide and had a seal-like skin or covering which had a sheen to it. It had no discernible head and did not move as I passed by. But that is the Grafton monster of our own universe. What about the one in the Fallout universe? Well, it's helpful to begin by understanding what pre-war America thought about the Grafton monster. Our first clue comes while exploring the Grafton mayor's office. Heading inside and opening the first door we find to the left, we can head into an employee's only area where we find a holotape on a wall shelf. The Beast of Grafton, Part 1. Welcome back, dear listeners. It's time once again to put aside all you think you know, all you believe to be true. It's time to open your mind to the strange, bizarre, and sometimes terrifying world that exists in the shadows and fringes of our own, where myth, legend, and rumor are made real. Yes, it's time for more thrilling tales from the West Virginia Hills. Tonight's episode, The Beast of Grafton, is brought to you by Dandy Boy Apples. Apples so good, they never go bad. And remember, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. where locals have reported a strange creature lurking in the woods. Robbie Cockrell and Peggy Mansfield were out on a date, celebrating Peggy's birthday. A full moon loomed large as they drove. Robbie, you're going too fast. Don't worry, this nuclear roadster handles like a dream. Where are you taking me anyway? I told you, it's a birthday surprise. Way out here in the woods? There's nothing this far out of Grafton, except that hospital by the river. Wait, I bet we're going to that new drive-in over in Clarksburg, right? Just so you can show off your slick new hot rod. Ah, uh, come on. Don't be like that, Peggy. I just thought the drive-in would be romantic. Oh, Bobby. So in our universe, Robert Cockrell is a reporter for the Grafton Sentinel, but in the Fallout universe, Robert Cockrell, or Robbie Cockrell, is a teenage boy on a date. But the universes converge in that both Robert Cockrells encountered the Grafton monster while driving down the road near the Tigert River. And after being spotted, the Grafton monster vanished in both universes. 
Our story picks up while exploring a voter registration tent behind a church in the southeastern corner of Grafton. There, on one of the tables, we find The Beast of Grafton, Part 2. Tonight, we bring you the final chapter of The Beast of Grafton. When last we left off, two teenagers, Robbie Cockrell and Peggy Mansfield, were running for their lives after a harrowing car accident, trying to escape a frightening creature stalking them. See? You're doing great. Just like when we won that three-legged race in the park. We're almost to the hospital. So in both universes, the Grafton monster is described as a large, boulder-like, headless creature. But that's where the similarities end. From this story, we walk away with the idea that the Grafton monster is created. The doctor injected Peggy Mansfield with something that began to turn her into a monster. 
And presumably this monster can be tamed. The doctor said that one ill-tempered one escaped, but another one had better manners. And we get the impression that the hospital they stumbled upon was not a hospital at all. Towards the end, Robert saw people wielding guns. The hospital was just its cover. It was really some sort of research facility. And perhaps the soldiers there tell us that it was a governmental research facility. But we have to remember, these are pre-war holotape plays. Even then, they were considered to be stories, fiction. But Stephen H. Patterson, the man responsible for creating these radio dramas, did his research, as we've already established in previous episodes. It's possible he crafted this tale based on real events. So could the governmental research facility part be true? Is the Grafton monster really engineered by man? To find out, we can head to the hunter's shack to see what Shelby O'Rourke had learned about the Grafton monster. We've read her entries about many of the other cryptids. In her entry on the Grafton monster, sightings zero, descriptive traits, very large, both in height and girth, potentially no head, white seal-like skin. Evidence log, recent footprints found at Beta site, took casts and photos. Locomotive sounding call, possible train in distance, unsure. That is a strange entry. We learn from the loading slides that Grafton was built on the shores of the Tigert River and that it was a hub for shipping prior to the Great War, thanks to having both water and railroad access. And there is a railway station just outside Grafton. Could it be that the Grafton monster, remembering the sound of the pre-war locomotives that would come through Grafton, began to imitate that sound as part of a warning call? But Shelby hadn't actually seen the monster. Let's see if we can find someone who had. Heading to Sugar Grove, we can check in with our favorite cryptid analyst, Beverly Solomon, to see if she had spotted one. And sure enough, we find a holotape, Cryptid Sighting, Grafton Monster, September 27th, 2077. Beverly Solomon, Cryptid Analyst, 92777. Grafton Monster Witness Report. This is from one of those spelunkers that roam the hills looking for abandoned mining claims. Can you imagine? Well, the classic four foot wide shoulders, headless profile, deep sonorous cry, they got a good glance at it. The witness didn't know what it was, but the description is very clear. It came out when she started playing mouth harp, apparently. <laughs> I'm gonna go out to look. Maybe that sound is the key. A description we are familiar with, even right down to being four feet wide, but being attracted to music, now that's new. Our next clue comes while exploring the West Tech facility. I covered everything in this building in a dedicated video that you can watch here. Deep inside the Advanced Mutations Lab, we find the Advanced Mutations Lab terminal. On this terminal, we discover that the scientists at West Tech were experimenting on the people of Huntersville with FEV, the forced evolutionary virus. The entries explore how difficult the process was for the scientists to come up with a stable formula. Most of their experiments were failures. But things get interesting while reading test subject reports. Moving to the end of the list, we can read report test subject AM53. October 23rd, 2077. This is the day the bombs dropped. So they were either working really early in the morning, or they made this entry just after the nuclear strike. Based on the success of AM52, we were confident in tweaking a few genomes for FEVS-00648. Unfortunately, the subject grew too large to contain. The containment unit broke, but AM53 was unharmed. Indeed, despite this and its apparent lack of a discernible head, subject AM53 was surviving its metamorphosis, far exceeding our expectations. Since our containment units were insufficient to hold the subject, we have arranged for immediate transport off-site under sedation. Follow-up visits to AM53 will be scheduled for observation and recording. It grew too large to contain? Lack of a discernible head? That can mean only one thing. 
The Grafton Monster is an FEV experiment. The monster is a former human being, a resident from the town of Huntersville, who was abducted by West Tech and the military and exposed to FEV. The terminal entry said that it grew too large for its enclosure. We do find a room here in West Tech that appears to be a bit of a beast pen. Perhaps this is where they stored the Grafton monster after sedating it. Their goal was to transfer it off-site after sedation, but this was written the day the bombs dropped. I doubt very much they were able to do so before the apocalypse, which means the Grafton monster woke up in this room, clambered out of West Tech, and out into Appalachia. And there they began to multiply, becoming numerous enough that they caught the attention of the Enclave. If we make our way inside the White Springs bunker, in the science wing we see that the Enclave have been monitoring the Grafton monster, perhaps trying to find a way to exploit the creature like they'll try to do with Death Claws in the Capital Wasteland many years later. We don't have an explanation why we find more than one Grafton monster. Perhaps this one test subject had infected other people over the past 25 years with its unique strain of FEV that created the Grafton monster. What's eerie about this is that West Tech only succeeded in creating the Grafton monster on the day the bombs dropped, and yet these pre-war radio plays, Tales from the West Virginia Hills, were suspiciously accurate. The Grafton monster was created. The substance, in this case FEV, may not have been injected, but it was created by man. A scientist working with the military in a research facility. Was that just a lucky guess on Stephen H. Patterson's part? Or did Subject AM-53, infected with FEV, just coincidentally take on the form and shape of a creature that had already become part of West Virginian lore? A clue to this answer is in the date of Beverly Solomon's holotape. It was recorded in September of 2077, but as we just learned from West Tech, this FEV experiment that became the Grafton Monster didn't find its way out of the research facility until October 23rd, 2077, a month after Beverly's Spelunker saw one. If the Grafton Monster we find in Appalachia really came from West Tech, how could Beverly's eyewitness have seen one before it left West Tech? Well, we find a final clue when we visit the ruins of Grafton. There we learn that the pre-war residents of Grafton had already embraced the Grafton monster. While exploring the ruins of Grafton, we have a chance to join an event put on by Grafton's robotic mayor called Grafton Day. This is Grafton's mayor with a priority message. It's Grafton Day! And there it is, the Grafton Monster. It's hostile to everything in the town, including super mutants, the Scorched, and ourselves. It fights the same way, spewing thick black tar out of its back and occasionally throwing tar ball projectiles that act as explosives. And it's flanked by iBots, spouting messages to the throngs of people who would come to the streets of Grafton to watch the parade. Mascot. Children are encouraged to stay out of the Grafton monster's reach. Let's hear it for the Grafton monster. So how are we supposed to interpret this? That the Grafton monster we've met existed before the war? And that the people of Grafton somehow tamed it and put it on parade down Main Street? Well, as we just learned from West Tech, that's impossible. The Grafton monster didn't exist until the day the bombs dropped, so I think the most likely explanation is that the Grafton monster already existed as part of local Grafton lore. It was celebrated in the town of Grafton with a yearly parade, and during that parade, someone would dress up in a mascot outfit and walk down the streets as the Grafton monster 
Or perhaps they made some sort of float with an animatronic on it that resembled the description of the fabled Grafton monster. The warnings from the iBots for children to keep their hands to themselves were likely tongue-in-cheek to frighten children, but not something the townsfolk took seriously. It must therefore be a coincidence that Subject AM53 mutated to take on the appearance and mannerisms of the fabled Grafton monster. Of course, if the myth was already established, leading to the radio plays, leading to the Grafton Day celebration, and if Beverly Solomon's eyewitness saw one before the Grafton monster we know ever left West Tech, could it be that even before FEV, there really was? A Grafton monster? If so, whatever happened to it? But now, 25 years after the apocalypse, the Grafton monster is real. We can encounter him at a variety of levels, a level 10 version almost always spawning in the tar pits near to the ruins of Charleston, and a level 30 version appearing in Grafton for the Grafton Day event. But more difficult versions do exist, including a level 40 parasitic Grafton monster that can sometimes spawn at White Springs, as well as level 50 and beyond Grafton monsters, which can appear during the Strangler Heart event and at Arctos Pharma during Project Paradise. And that's the full story of the Grafton monster in Fallout 76. What are your experiences with the Grafton monster? Where have you stumbled upon him in the game? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish new videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have and you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I have a brand new shirt in the shop, Lion's Pride. That's right, it's everyone's favorite elite fighting unit within the East Coast Brotherhood of Steel during the events of Fallout 3. You can find this design on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. It comes on other products as well, like mugs, smartphone cases, posters, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.